And thus, we begin. First off, I'd like to welcome you all uh, to Geography for World Building. Uh, the whole thing here is to understand how to actually apply geographic concepts to world building when it comes to sci-fi or fantasy or even if you're just developing a whole new culture. So my name is James Pete. Uh, officially, I go by James S. Pete. Um, and yes, you can see I have a whole slew of letters behind my name. Now, some people are asking, what are those letters? Well, the PhD, as you know, stands for post hole digger or piled higher and deeper. Uh, the CFE is a professional certificate. I'm a certified fraud examiner. And yes, I do financial investigations in fraud. GGTL, that's something offered by the University of Washington. It just means I have a certificate in global trade, transportation, and logistics because that's what my PhD was going after. Y'all know what an MA and a BA are. Does anybody know what an AAGG is? <laughs> Has anybody ever seen Dudley Do Right? <laughs> All around good guy. <laughs> and if you don't know what BFD is, I'm not going to tell you. It'll let somebody else tell you. And yes, it does mean what I th you think it means. <laughs> Anyhow, how many of you have ever seen this map? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The worst freaking map in the world. <laughs> OK? I mean, l look at the lack of geography here. It's like, you know, Tolkien just threw mountains up everywhere. He didn't care, you know, Mount Doom right there in the middle of freaking Mordor, you know, just. <sighs> There's not a geographer in the world who likes this map. <laughs> the only reason it works is because all of you probably don't know geography. And you just suspend belief and go with, okay, Tolkien knows what he's writing about because this is a fantasy world. And yes, it is. It's Middle Earth. Okay, it's not the surface of the Earth. Remember that. So therefore, it doesn't really apply. Okay, a little bit about me. Uh, first off, I do have a PhD in geography. As a matter of fact, I have a master's and a bachelor's degree in geography. Uh, I went to the University of Miami for the undergrad. Cal State uh, Hayward for my master's and the University of Washington for the PhD. I have to tell a little story on that one real quick as UW PhD program was like in the top 10. And so I applied to the top 10 program and then I applied to the bottom program. I mean, I'm not talking bottom 10, I'm talking bottom. I didn't get into the bottom. I never figured that out. All right, so uh, I have been teaching geography uh, up until recently at the college and university level for the last 25 years. Uh, so I have a little bit of experience in this. And for those of you who may have heard of DigiPen Institute of Technology, I developed the first ever geography and cartography for world building course for the video game industry ever. So this was just like, <laughs> Wow, you know, and I had some of the most amazing students. By the way, DigiPen is one of the best video game development schools in the world. So I was very happy to teach there and even happier when I stopped paying my daughter's tuition after she graduated. <laughs> so, and yes, I am an author. I have two series out, the Core of Discovery series, which is a cross-time adventure, and the Chronicles of Hayek, which is actually the prequel series to the Core of Discovery series. And I operate two... Nope, YouTube channel called Action and Adventure Tips. This is designed for you content creators so you don't mess it up and get that dreaded one-star review. So, for example, how many of you know where the safety on a Glock is? <laughs> how many of you think a sa Glock has a safety that you can click on and off? <laughs> okay, the answer is no. No, it does not. <laughs> the safety is on the triggers. This is what I talk about is little things like don't mess up the little details because you're going to piss people off. Such as, how many of you know that hyenas are not canines? I didn't until one of my reviewers pointed it out. So anyhow, moving right along. Um, when you're talking about world building, you're going to be considering two major things. The first one is the physical geography or whatever your world is. Geo, of course, means Earth. Graphy is from graphene, which means to write. So geographene, to write about the world or the Earth. You know, you're, you may be having lunography or marsography. You know, or you could be somewhere else in a different stellar uh, system. Okay, and the other thing is cultural geography or whatever your world is. So let's start off with the basics. Everything revolves around physical geography. 
It dictates climate and it dictates biogeography, the plants and the animals. How often are you going to see a hippo wandering around in the desert? <coughs> Excuse me, I'm uh, chemically sensitive, so if I'm sneezing and coughing, that's what that is. It dictates where humans settle or where whatever your humanoid species may settle. You know, if they're a lizard species, they may be settling in the desert. But if they happen to be humans, we need one particular thing. Water, exactly. We need lots of water. And we like to settle near water. Why? Because it dictates transportation. So connectivity. You cannot have settlements exist as if there's nothing else around them in isolation. You actually have to be able to have connectivity going on. So the question is, you know, how are you going to do it? What's the biggest connectivity uh, link we have on Earth? Water, the Mississippi River, or any of those rivers. Any country that doesn't have a good riverine system, they're hosed when it comes to economics. Or if your river system happens to freeze up in the winter. Russia, exactly, where rivers flow north, just like the Nile. Of course, the Russians are in denial. <laughs> so, what are the biggest players in physical geography? Well, let's take a look at the big one. Ooh, the sun. What is that bright orange light in the sky? Suns range in size and mass and color. I mean, when you take a look at the sun, what color is our sun? Yellow. What's the uh, coolest flavor of sun? Let's try that again. What's the coolest flavor of sun? <laughs> red. Okay, the color spectrum goes from the coolest being red, orange, yellow, white, then blue. Just like if you have a gas range and you turn it on. You know, there's white, blue, and there's blue, white, but we're not going to get into particulars on that. And you can also have little tiny suns, little dwarves, to huge ones. The huge ones are not too common, though. So... Another factor to consider is the distance from the sun. Okay, how many of you would like to go to Mercury? A little warm, eh? Yeah, but Earth, that's nice. Why? Because we have water in all sorts of forms. We have gas, we have liquid, and we have solid. On other planets, you don't have that choice. You know, uh, let's take a look at orbits. What kind of orbit do we have? Is it a nice circular one? If you've ever seen that TV show from the 1980s called Fridays, here's the answer. No, 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 no. Now, what we have is an elliptical orbit. Sometimes during perihelion, we're really close to the sun, in our case, about 91 million miles. And during aphelion, we're further away, so 94 million miles or so. What does that mean to climates? A lot. Anybody here other than Juliana from the southern hemisphere? Some people have lived there. Okay, their summers are a little cooler than our summers. Why is that? Distance from the sun. Plus, they're also surrounded by water. Water is a huge player. Axial tilt, that will affect climate. You know, if your planet just revolves around like this, you don't have any axial tilt, you're not gonna have much change. But if you do have axial tilt, once again, lots of change. You know, it causes all sorts of things, winds and stuff like that. And here, the big one, plate tectonics. Anybody from the Pacific Northwest? <laughs> all right, how many of you are aware that we have a 9.1 coming up one of these days? Yeah, all of us do now, right? The Cascadia subduction zone. Earthquakes, got to love them. So let's talk a little bit about plate tectonics. <coughs> these are the building blocks of geomorphology, or the shape of the Earth. As far as we know, every planet we've identified so far has some sort of a plate tectonic issue going on with it. Um, we haven't discovered many planets out of our solar system, but we sort of think that might exist. They build mountains. Anybody been to the Cascades? The Sierra Nevada? And by the way, it is Sierra Nevada. It is not Sierra Nevada's. You know, um, the Swiss Alps? Okay, uh, the Urals. Uh, one person. Oh, man, I thought I had people there. Okay, Himalayans, or as they say in India, the Himala Himalayans. 
I know that because I have a Himalayan motorcycle. Awesome thing. All right, volcanoes and islands are all constructed due to plate tectonic movement, and it provides us with nice little things such as earthquakes uh, and deep ocean trenches and all that fun stuff and tsunamis, eha. So let's take a look at the Earth itself. So maybe you might be able to incorporate some of that. First off, you got your nice little inner core here with your outer core, and then you have what's called a mantle, and then you have the asthenosphere, which consists of a whole bunch of little things, the upper mantle and then the lower mantle. And then finally, you have your atmosphere. That's all the gas. Anybody know how thick our atmosphere is? Well, about 60 miles. Once you get into 62, you're where? Outer space, exactly. And that's where you get your little astronaut wings. How many of you have got astronaut wings? OK, good, nobody. I don't have them yet either. I do want them. Most of the activity that we're used to seeing is taking place in the crust, uh, specifically in uh, the upper mantle where here you have the oceanic crust and the continental crust, the two of which are completely different. Generally speaking, the oceanic crust is basaltic and it is colder and denser. Why is that? Water. Water is the answer. So it will generally tend to sink under, let's see if I can get my laser beam working here, sink under the continental crust, which is actually granitic, granitic in nature. So what you have happening is with all this thermal dynamics going on in the asthenosphere, which is kind of driving things around, sort of like if you've ever boiled anything in a pot, like maybe gravy, and you watch the edges bubbling up, and then everything's going out to the edges, and you get all burnt on the outside of the pot? Or is that just me? <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, that's what's happening right here. So you actually have an uh, actual rift in the Earth where the plates are separating. You may have heard of the Mid-Atlantic Rift. That's where it's happening. That's one area amongst ever. I think uh, there's like 11 major plates, maybe 21 plates overall. So you'll have the uh, plates actually moving away from the center with new magma boiling up, creating new earth. So this shows that Mark Twain was wrong. Don't buy real estate because they're not making any more of it. They are. It's just underwater. Um, so maybe you should. Anyhow, uh, what happens then is you will actually have the oceanic plate subduct going under the continental plate. And once it starts doing that, sometimes it sticks and sticks and sticks, and then it lets go. Boom, big earthquake. We saw that in Japan with their nine points, something like that. We saw that in uh, Banda Aceh on the Boxing Day earthquake. Um, and the other thing we have happening here is all of a sudden it starts melting and melting stuff tends to bubble up. So then we have mountains. So some of these mountains, of course, are, uh, shall we say, they burp a bit. Anybody ever been to Mount St. Helens? Yeah, nice little uh, volcanic eruption. Uh, matter of fact, Mount Rainier, which is a nice little view from my uh, deck and from my office when I type. I can look out and look at the snow-capped volcano that's sitting there waiting to kill us all. You know. So this is how you get your formation of the uh, volcanoes. You also get formations of islands, uh, archipelagos, island arcs, the Philippines, Japan, Indonesia. All of these are created through this process. And here are our plates. And look, we're right here on the North America plate. That's, that sucker is huge. So we're in a relatively good area right here. Where I live, right there where the little Juan de Fuca plate is, that bad boy subducts, whoosh, earthquakes. And as you can see, we have what's called a ring of fire that actually goes all the way around the uh, Pacific. Let's see, actually, do I have that now? Yeah, I think I do. But anyhow, here's a little bit more of an example uh, of what these things actually look like. Uh, you might have a, a hot spot, which is just basically a very hot place in the asthenosphere that's just bubbling up constantly, creating islands. Uh, the Hawaiian Islands are one such space. And that, because the north, uh, the Pacific plate is actually moving, and we can actually track how far it's moved over how many years, and it's about 35 centimeters per year that that plate is moving, 
And you can just see a string of islands. And beyond the islands, you actually see a string of seamounts, which are islands that have been eroded. So why don't you think about that? Maybe you might want to have a civilization that's on a seamount, you know, just like with domes or something like that. All righty. Uh, so yeah, so sometimes we have, oops, I'm sorry. You know, plates that can be moving, splitting up, traveling in the same direction, but just like on a highway, you know, when you got that old person in the left lane doing 50, you know, and you're wanting to do 60 or 70 or in some cases 90, so you have to pass in the right lane. That's the exact same thing that's happening with some of our plates. Continents can be stationary. They could be moving around. They could be slamming into each other, creating all sorts of mountains. Okay, let's talk about volcanoes. Who likes volcanoes? They're cute until they blow up and kill people. So we've got two basic types of volcanoes, the first type being a composite volcano and the second type being a shield volcano. Uh, and a shield volcano, the reason it's called a shield volcano is it looks like somebody just laid a shield down on the ground. So it's this big, long mountain. Matter of fact, uh, Mauna Loa or Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa I think just means long mountain. So you get that idea. And uh, we also, as I mentioned, you have the hot spots or the mantle plumes. So anybody know what this is? Oh, no, no, no. That, that's the name. I didn't ask you what the name of it was. Okay, we're got, okay, I heard it over here. Who said that? Composite volcano. All right. When these bad boys blow up, they blow up. I mean, we're talking a violent eruption with pyroclasts flying all over the place and landing on people in cars. You know, if you've ever been to, um, what's that place in Italy? I can't think right now. Pompeii, thank you. That's what happened there. They had a very violent eruption of Pompeii and buried everybody in ash so fast that they didn't even get have time to get out of town. Um, and just, I'm, I can't wait to go there myself. My daughter just went. Here's what I see. This is another composite volcano. When this thing goes, it's going to go huge. As a matter of fact, this land that you see here is a mud debris field that's 500 feet thick from the last election uh, eruption, the Osceola mud flow, as it's called. And these things will erupt, and they will just cause massive devastation. OK, can anybody guess what and where this is? How did you know? Oh. I should never have thrown that tree in there. Yes, this is Kilimanjaro, which is actually a shield volcano. All right, and once again, showing uh, the motion of the Hawaiian Islands, brrr, like that. And then we have super volcanoes. They're the things that just blow up and kill everything. So uh, Yellowstone, uh, the Newberry Caldera, these are all out west. Who knows where the next one's going to blow up? So this is something you might want to incorporate when you're actually building your worlds is, you know, what kind of volcanoes are we going to have? Are we going to have big effusive eruptions that things just flow like Mauna Loa? Or are we, we going to have world-ending eruptions <laughs> such as that? All right, circulation, climate. I'm going to try and go through this stuff faster. Uh, bear with me. Two types, oceanic and atmospheric. Basically, uh, on Earth, because we're spinning around on an axial tilt, we actually have uh, two types of uh, circulation going on due to Coriolis force. The first one is what we would call clockwise. That's in the northern hemisphere. If you go to the southern hemisphere and flush the toilet, what happens? Water goes down the toilet. But what we're actually looking at in the oceans are counter or anti-clockwise circulation. I say anti-clockwise for our Kiwi friends. I'm not sure if they know what counterclockwise means because I never saw that down there. So that this actually does a lot. El Nino, you may have heard of. Okay, it transports warm water. In this case, the Gulf Stream keeps Britain, which, as you'll notice, is like way up there north, way north of us, relatively warm. You can also have cold currents coming down, which is why you don't go swimming in Washington State. In Washington, beaches are not for swimming. They're for driving on or digging clams. But the idea of going into the water, you know, no, that's just too cold. Atmospheric circulation, you have these big things called Hadley cells. You can see what's happening is at the equator, 
oh, the air is rising, it goes up, it gets cool, it comes back down, and the same thing is happening like that. That's one of the reasons why we actually have bands of deserts right here, is all the warm, dry air that's coming down, the heat caused by the friction of the air molecules moving downward, dries out stuff. You know, uh, will that change when the climate changes? Yes, yes it will. And speaking of climate, these are our current climates. We have all sorts of climates all over the world. Tropical wet, all the way up to ice. And this is the ideal climate. So if anybody wants this slide, this is a great slide. I love this one. You know, this is what the Earth would look like, you know, based on our land mass and land distribution and uh, the oceanic and atmospheric circulation. So consider that when you're building your worlds. And of course, mountains create something called barriers. So anytime you've got mountains, you better have one side that is dry while the other side is wet. If you've ever been to Hawaii, you know what I mean. If you've ever been to Washington State, it's the same thing. My house, I get 58 inches of rain a year on my house. You go just t you know, like 15, 20 miles away, they get 15 inches a year. Why? Cascade Mountains. Biogeography, critters. <laughs> what lives where? That's an important thing. You've got plants and you've got critters. Maybe you might want to throw in something like a Wallace line where animals weren't able to trans go cross it. If you go to Australia, they have these weird-looking animals called kangaroos and duck-billed platypus and possums. Yes, Juliana knows all about those possum things. They're just evil. They've taken over New Zealand, and they're not the same friendly possums we have. But these are things where animals can't cross over because of some sort of physical barrier. So consider that. And you might want to consider that for your people, too. I mean, it took uh, thousands of years, tens of thousands, before people were actually crossing these lines. All right. How many of people have heard the phrase Persia? Okay, you know it's not just a country in the Middle East that doesn't exist anymore, right? All right. It actually has, this is an acronym for those of you who have never heard of it. Uh, it stands for political, economic, religion, or religious, social, intellectual, and arts. So what are these various things? Well, the political stuff. Does this look like the kind of group that you would like to join? If the answer is yes, don't answer. Um, Politics comes in all sorts of flavors. You could have, like here in the United States, a democracy or a republic, and there is a difference between a democracy and a republic, but either way, they both entail voting of the citizenry. You could have an autocracy. You know, um, That autocracy could be a dictatorship, it could be fascism, or it could be communism. When you're thinking of fascism, think of Benito Mussolini's Italy, Hitler's Germany. Um, and when you're thinking communism, I want you to think of how it's been tried like forever, ever since Marx came up with it. There's a reason why communism at the national level doesn't work. It's because humans want more than what communism can provide. And so it winds up being a authoritarian regime. It could be a monarchy. You know, look at Great Britain before they became more of a democracy. Oligarchy, a ruling class. If you're into conspiracy theory, you could say that we have that here in the United States with Jeff Bezos and uh, Tesla dude, Elon Musk, you know, or and Bill Gates or things like that. Do they control it? I'll let you make that conspiracy theory. Um, and you might have a colonial system or... You could have something else completely. I mean, how many people here have read the original Starship Troopers? Okay, the bugs. Do they have any of those? Well, they may be a monarchy in a way, if you will, but you know, there's like a collective mindset, a hive. So these are things to consider. <sighs> what is war? Basically, it's the continuation of policy through other means, as von Clausewitz said back in the 1800s. So war but for itself is not just a happening thing. It happens because of politics. So whenever you're writing some sort of military science fiction that involves war, it has to include a political component unless you're just writing it from the uh, grunt level. So you're not really looking at that higher level. But here's an important thing. Democracies 
do not fight, at least on Earth. There has never been a recorded war between two democracies. You know, I want you to think about that. If you want to, go ahead. I've done enough research on this. That That's my belief. So what are the causes of war? First off, economic resources. I mean, you can look at any colonialism. You know, that's, you know, if you literally, all colonialism was related to resources. God, gold, and guns, as the uh, Spanish conquistadors would say. Could be territorial gain, not just resources, but they want territory. Lebensraum in the United States, we had manifest destiny. And yes, we did have that. The Indian Wars, you may have heard of it. Could be religion, such as what's happening right now in Israel. Uh, it could be like what happened in Ireland between the Catholics and the Protestants. You know, throw in any religion, you're going to have a war. Nationalism. Fascism was nationalism. So World War II. World War II was an outbreak on World War I, revenge. And you could have a civil war, or as I like to say, a very uncivil war, such as the U.S. War of Rebellion, which many of you may call the... Um, Civil war, uh, th this is the actual term, by the way, war of rebellion. The war between the states is a term brought up by Southerners who lost, um, or as they call it, the war of Northern aggression. Yes, I heard that a lot. And it could be a revolutionary war, overthrowing the pra past organization, such as the United States, France, and whoever else. And finally, it could be a defensive war. For those of you who are unaware of history, Russia needs to expand. It needs to get those blockades going on all its territory because right, right now it is wide open to be run over by everybody. That's why the Ukraine war is happening right now. They're trying to extend their defensive realm out to the mountains. Are they going to make it? At this stage, they're pretty doomed. Their demographics are against them, and they have a lot of Chinese on their other border taking up most of Siberia. So, yeah, those are the wars. Let's talk about economic systems. First type is what we call a traditional economic system, barter. You know, such as, Sean, I've got a great novel. I'll trade you my great novel for two of your novels that I don't think are as great as mine. <laughs> Sean's a better author than I am. <laughs> you know, so that's what we're talking about. And many uh, pre-industrial societies have this kind of system. Uh, and then you get into the industrial societies, the trading societies. Now we've moved into capitalism. You know, it's like, I have some gold. I will give you gold if you will give me two of your books. John's like, I'm up for that. You know, uh, free market system. Is the United States a free market? No, 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 no. You want to see the free market in America? Look at the drug market. That's a free market. Okay, any other aspect of American is a uh, mixed economy. But what about a command economy? That's communism. That's where somebody from up top dictates what gets produced. You also see that in fascism. You know, uh, whoever dictates what is growing or is uh, being manufactured is telling you what to do. There's no real input. I mean, that's why you'll just see massive production of stuff that nobody wants or needs, but those in the leadership think they know, and they don't. And then finally, we have the mixed economy, what some would call socialism, where some things are manufactured through a capitalist means of market demand, and others are manufactured or done through social avenues, such as um, providing police. How many of you like having police handy to stop the bad guys from doing things? You realize the bad guy, the police are not required to stop the bad guys. There's nothing constituted. Hmm? Exactly. And I'm a former cop, so I know this. All okay, right, religion. Muy, muy importante, as they say. Very important. What does it control? It controls things like behaviors. If you come from a fundamentalist society, are you going to be drinking alcohol on a Sunday at church? Probably not. Not unless your religion actually you know, says you can do that. Even though, what was the first miracle Jesus did? Water into wine. Yes, I like that one. Uh, practices. What kind of practices happen? How about morals? You know, uh, I would say pretty much everybody in here would probably say, you know, child uh, pedophilia is not a good thing. Well, that's just our morals speaking. That's not somebody else's morals speaking. 
So, but religion will dictate this stuff. Uh, beliefs, you know, what do you believe in? Do you believe in a single God who dictates your life, or do you believe in a single God who just says, eh, do whatever you want, but just don't do bad things? Once again, belief systems. Worldviews. Uh, this is an important one. I mean, if you take a look at a thing like Buddhism, where you value life as opposed to Christianity, where you say that all this life was put down for us to use, you know, that could dictate how you uh, look at things. Prophecies. How many times do we know that the world is coming to an end? Oh, all the time. And I'd love to see these guys who are out there prognosticating and saying, uh, you're wrong how many times now? No. And then ethics. Ethics is a very strong thing. You know, what's right for one thing is maybe wrong for another. So let's take a look at the types of religions that are out there. First off, you have your single deity. You know, the one God, Jehovah, Yahweh, whatever you want to call him. You might have multiple deities like, you know, the Romans had or uh, the Greeks. You have your greater deities and your lesser deities. Now, for you know, just a little bit of sarcasm here, I'm actually a religious, but uh, I do belong to the Church of the Salmon. And so I go out and I cast upon the waters, and I pray to the great god Chinook, and the lesser gods, Coho, Sockeye, Steelhead. So that's what I'm talking about, things like that. Chinook is king, so, and Coho is also silver. Uh, I do not pray to the god sh uh, Chum. Just, you know, Sean will back me up on this one. So, you could have animism where you actually, you know, consider animals and spirits and such like that. Or you could have a secular society or an atheistic one. And finally, you could have one in which there is a ruler is the deity. Can anybody name one in modern times? <laughs> Japan. Emperor Hirohito, that was one of the conditions for surrender in 1945. Okay, let's look at the social component of it. You could have interactions between peoples and group. You have interactions in the family, and we're down to 10 minutes, and I want to keep going fast. Gender, I mean, if you're gay or transgender and you go to Russia, <whistles> you're in for a world of hurt, and in many places, as a matter of fact. Uh, but in some places, we're fine. In some places, women are treated better than men. In some places, men consider women to be beneath them. Uh, inequalities, they exist. So what about the intellectual? Hmm. Learning how and what. If you're a religious fundamentalist area, do you think you're going to be doing a lot of STEM learning? Generally not. You might be in a madras learning all about the Quran, and that's about it. Philosophy, you know, where are we from, where are we going, that kind of a fun thing. Ah, I'm down to 10 minutes, 11, yeah. Math, science, technology, all of these are important. And, of course, you have the arts, such as uh, regular art, like paintings, statues, sculptures, architecture. Ah, what's next? Music. How many of you like music? Okay, yeah. I mean, how many of you listen to bread and suck down a bottle of scotch? Don't do that. You'll be depressed. Uh, literature. Ooh, how many of you here like literature? Okay, yeah. If you raise your hand, you're in the wrong conference. Okay, we're all into that whole literature thing. So, this is where I'd like to end it. If you have any questions, I'm here. If you want my contact info or you have any questions, take a picture. I'm always glad to answer questions. And we have exactly ten minutes left. Well, nine plus two. I'm supposed to 11. I've got uh, kind of a... Civil and Swan 2 check. <laughs> so um, in general, selfish question, um, my book's dystopian, 2084. I was just, what comes to mind with like the UK area in that time period, uh, weather-wise and any potential natural disasters or anything? Okay, if we're going to project current trends into the future, first off, you're going to see a dumbing down of the population because that's already happening. Um, you're going to see fewer resources. I mean, England doesn't have the capacity to feed itself uh, or even power itself. Uh, climate change, you know, this is a big subject for a lot of people. My opinion is real simple is that 
where I used to live was under 1,000 feet of ice 10,000 years ago. You know, 10,000 years from now, maybe it'll be under 1,000 feet of ice again. The climate is always changing. <coughs> There's a number of things that could happen. You could see some melting, continued melting of the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet, which would raise the sea levels. So the Thames wouldn't probably exist, the estuary. It would probably either be larger and all that lowland, like uh, all the cities that are in England itself will probably be flooded a little bit. I mean, it doesn't have to be much. You just have to bring flooding up a couple of inches, and that will wipe out. You know, you bring it up a foot, you're going to lose a couple thousand square miles. So, and pollution. Oh, there we go. Everybody's going to be burning whatever they can instead of clean fuels. So, dystopian. Eric. <coughs> How is it that science most science fiction um, franchises, when they visit another planet, uh, the planet has only one town? Um, do you think that should be allowed, and how would you handle that? Well, first off, I would fire the writers because that's not a possibility. You cannot have just a single town. Um, there has never been a time in the last 10,000 years where you've had a single town or a single city. Now, you will have a city that is you know, typically much larger than the next largest city. For example, Paris is considerably greater than uh, Marseille. We call that a primate city. You know, it's easily double the next size of the uh, next largest city. Um, and being I don't watch television, hello? Yeah, I don't watch television. I really don't know what the franchises are doing, so they could uh, go pound. No. Um, I was wondering about how uh, area might affect like innovation or what sort of things would you expect to affect that? There's a couple of things that affect education. First off is religion. That's the primary. I was looking at innovation. Innovation, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that's the primary thing is religion. You know, if you've got a religion that doesn't believe in change, you're not going to have change. The other thing is, of course, education and freedom. Freedom is a very important thing, the freedom for the exchange of ideas. If you have a closed society that doesn't allow for freedom, you're not going to see as much innovation taking place. So using all the tools that you've given us and some of the principles behind them, um, I wonder, since we're still be amateur at best at creating new worlds, are there any tools you know of that could help to create new maps or realistic, uh, at least, land masses that we could then use for, may, uh, in my case, fantasy literature? Your own mind. Literally. I mean, you just think about it. What do you want to create? I mean, if your planet is going to be very tectonically active, you're going to have a lot of mountains. If it's not very tectonically active, you know, whatever mountains you have may have eroded. You know, if you're tr if you're looking for a tool like Encarta or something like that for creating maps, there are plenty of maps. Just Google free mapping software fantasy, and it'll pop up. Um, I wonder if uh, there have been reports about like the magnetic field is moving from like. It always the, is. Uh, but it's moving faster, and there are all these theories about why. I was wondering if there was a case, if there was going to be some kind of tilt. You, do you mean is the Earth physically going to flip? No, I, I mean like if the magnetic poles flip, mm -hmm. as they did in the past. It's a continuous process. The uh, magnetic uh, poles have always switched. That's one way we were able to actually develop the uh, hypothesis, which is now a theory of plate tectonics, is by taking a look at the um, direction that minerals were facing over a course of time as you got further and further away from the mid-Atlantic ridge. They were doing core samples, and it's like, well, they're pointing north, they're pointing south, they're pointing north, they're kind of pointing halfway. So this is a common thing. It's not really going to affect you know, the lithosphere or the asthenosphere. Where we may have an impact, though, is will it weaken our magnetic field, which actually prevents cosmic rays from getting into the Earth? That's why we have the aurora borealis and the aurora australis. Um, those cosmic rays can alter our DNA. So that's one thing to consider. How will our DNA alter? Is that all? Come on up. <laughs> Yeah, we got a couple minutes still. Just to just to follow up, 
you, when you were talking about the estuaries in that area, you said uh, Greenland, the, the ice was one factor. What was the other location? Antarctica. Okay. That has the largest ice mass on Earth. I mean, everybody thinks of Greenland because it's right up here because it's in our backyard. Yeah. But the reality is if Antarctica, which, by the way, was not in Antarctica before, it wasn't until it moved there that we actually stopped the uh, um, oceanic uh, circulation from taking place, which was actually what kept the Earth warmer. So what we need to do is somehow move Antarctica out of the way. And, and by the way, uh, for those who are worried about climate change slash global warming being bad, let me point out that what you're going to do is actually increase temperatures, which will actually increase uh, the ability for biomass to develop throughout the northern and southern hemispheres. You know, you're going to have longer growing periods or longer periods where things are going to be able to grow. So it's actually a beneficial thing. I, you know, and I still remember one guy saying, oh, no, we're going to have malaria in Siberia. You know what? We've had malaria in Siberia recorded for hundreds of years. I mean, the last big outbreak was around 1905. So don't worry about global warming, folks. Worry about the next election and, the, you know, what pollution is taking place. For uh, flight travel, um, astronauts and getting rockets up, they take advantage of the Earth's spin. Mm -hmm. So they want to be on the East Coast in, in the U.S., but there's real estate issues like on the East Coast of Miami, for example. Um, they can't do it, so they go to South Texas or things like that. With U the U.K., would there be an ideal spot to have those kinds of rockets? Yes, the United States. No, the reason why the United States is actually shooting things off on the East Coast isn't because of being closer. I mean, yeah, the closer you are to the equator, the easier it is to get things into a um, station, geostationary orbit. You know, and for those of you who are unaware, once you're in orbit, you're not stationary, really, you're just falling. But you're falling at the same rate as the Earth is spinning, which is about 25,000 miles per hour. So it just stays up there. And you can have a polar orbit, which is a much more complicated aspect. But the reason we have all these bases on the East Coast is so that when things blow up, like the Challenger, they don't land on population centers. They land in the ocean. And who cares about little fishies, right? And we're down to two minutes. No, it's not unrealistic. You're just, it's going to be a lot more expensive, uh, and it's going to be more fuel to get into a geostationary orbit. I mean, the UK is great if you want to do ballistic missiles, like to Russia. <laughs> they have them. <laughs> okay, anything else? Have you ever heard of... Uh, Harlan Ellison, is he a writer you, you've ever read or heard of? Who? Harlan Ellison. Harlan Ellison, I'm sorry. I've heard. He did this thing, uh, it was a project with some other science fiction writers called Medea. They made a, f it, it was like trying to use hard science. I'm sorry, am I not coming through? Oh, you've got two minutes. Yeah, you're coming through. They, they, they got but together, the idea for the book was a discussion about trying to go through hard science. A lot of the other sci-fi writers were scientists themselves, which mm -hmm. was kind of beneficial. It was the only thing I had ever seen that came close to doing the things that you're doing now, where it, they actually went over what planets would have to look like, what moons would have to look like. Uh, from a geographic standpoint and other natural science uh, realities and, and, and chemistry and everything. Do you know of any other like sources for, for things like that there that have, is have been uncovered or done? There is a book on world building, and uh, if you email me, take a picture, I will uh, hunt it down for you. I'm actually in the process of writing a book on cartography and geography for world building, specifically designed for game developers. But, yeah, there is a book out there that talks about this stuff, and it actually gets into much, much, much more scientific detail than what I've covered here. I mean, they get down into the molecular level. You know, it's like, are we silicon-based or are we graphite-based? And that's it. I'm done. Goodbye. <laughs>